Okay, I think um, numbers seem to be stabilizing now. So um, perhaps I'll introduce uh, Andrew Stewart from Caltech, uh, who is going to be speaking about supervised learning in Banach space. Thank you, Amanda. And thank you, uh, everybody involved in getting this enterprise off the ground. I was initially reluctant to be involved in uh, Zoom seminars, hoping that the whole issue would disappear quickly. But that's not going to happen. And I, I embrace this new world. So I think it's a, a great opportunity to communicate more widely. And I'm grateful for the organizers for making that possible. Um, I'm going to turn off my visuals just in view of bandwidth and concentrate on the slides. So um, the topic of the talk is supervised learning in Banach space. And before launching into it, I wanted to tell you three things. Firstly, I'm not going to assume that you know what supervised learning is. So I'll say a couple of things about what that is. Um, secondly, I'm going to explain to you why I want to do it in a Banach space, um, what the important scientific context for that is. And thirdly, the connection to probability. There are, there are many connections to probability. Um, and as you'll see, uh, those are manifest in different ways. So supervised learning is basically one of the most successful uh, examples of machine learning from the last few decades. It's a methodology for learning mappings from data. And perhaps the simplest example is the classification of images. Um, image classification is the learning of a mapping which takes an image and determines what class it belongs to. Is the uh, image a dog or a cat or a car or a house and so forth. And that's a purely data-driven methodology that has been incredibly successful and for which there is little theory. The reason I'm interested in studying that question in Banach space, so that's the question of finding mappings between elements of input Banach spaces and output Banach spaces is because this holds the potential for speeding up a large number of tasks that arise in science and engineering. And I'll explain to you how that arises. Sorry about the noise for a second, that should disappear. And uh, thirdly, I wanted to say the connections to probability, that they're multiple. Firstly, I'm going to give you a very clean mathematical definition of the supervised learning problem. That involves probability as an inherent part of the definition. Um, secondly, um, to the extent that we've developed theory around what I'm going to describe to you, um, that theory is inherently involves uh, ideas from probability theory. And thirdly, some of the methods that are used, in particular the random features method that I will describe, is inherently a probabilistic method. So the um, the subject is really fits well within the realm of applied probability. Now, th there's basically one overarching idea in this paper, in this uh, talk, and, and then three instantiations of that idea. Um, and the overarching idea is an idea which has served many people well in different areas of science and engineering, um, and that is to conceptualize problems in infinite dimensions conceptualize algorithms for them in an infinite dimensional setting before discretizing them to make practical algorithms. So I'll return to that idea if you didn't catch it, but it, it is the one overarching idea within this talk. Uh, once I've explained to you what supervised learning is, why I want to do it in a Banach space. <clears throat> but I will then show you uh, three specific examples uh, of this idea, and they come from uh, three different papers, all of which are on the archive, and um, involve different collaborators, all of whom are from Caltech. Um, Kaushik and, and Anima are colleagues in mechanical engineering and computer science, respectively. Um, we're working with postdocs uh, Bamdad, um, Kamyar, Bergida, and PhD students uh, Nick Nelson, Nick Kavachki, and Zongyi Li. So this is really a collaborative effort, and I'm the lucky one that gets to present it to you. So um, <clears throat> I'm going to explain to you what supervised learning is. Again, I'm not going to make the assumption that you know what it is. 
um, I'm going to repeatedly try and get across to you um, the one overarching idea which unifies the three different papers I'm going to describe. And I will first encounter that idea in the section entitled A Talk in a Couple of Slides. And then in the following three sections, I will describe specific instantiations of this methodology. Um, the model reduction approach, random features approach, and the graph kernel approach. Um, I may not have time to go into as much detail as I'd like with the last, and I'll see how, how timing goes. Okay, so let me start by telling you what we mean by supervised learning and reiterate that I'm not going to assume that you have experience in this field, although I hope there's something for you to learn if you do have experience in this field. So the setting is this. We have a mapping, which I'll call Psi Dagger. Dagger denotes some notion of a true but unknown mapping, which one wishes to uncover from data. And that, <clears throat> that mapping takes two spaces uh, X, maps a space X into a space Y. And the, the classical examples of supervised learning are regression, in which, <clears throat> excuse me, in which X and Y are Euclidean spaces, RQ and RR, and classification in which the input space X is RQ and the output space is a set of classes which I label from one to K. And the basic methodology or the basic idea of supervised learning is to find a parametric approximation of Psi Dagger given instances of inputs and outputs to the map without any other knowledge of that mapping. So the data one is given are pairs xn and yn uh, labeled by lowercase n and there are uppercase n of them and the assumption is although this can be relaxed to include noise but the assumption is that the yn's are related to the xn's through application of the map psi dagger but psi dagger is not known. So in this methodology, one introduces a parameter space, which I'll call throughout this talk, uppercase theta, and elements of that parameter space will be lowercase theta. And this will be finite dimensional, um, RP, although P may need to grow for various approximation theorems that I'll describe later on. Um, the approximation class then is a um, set of mappings that take X crossed with the parameter space theta into Y. And the goal of supervised learning is to identify a parameter theta star such that when you take the function psi, evaluate it as a mapping from x to y at this specific parameter theta star, it is a good approximation of psi dagger. Okay, so that, as stated, is a basic problem in approximation theory. No mention of probability as yet. So on the next slide, I'm going to link this to probabilistic formulation of the problem, and in particular, probabilistic formulation of the problem of determining the parameter theta. So I'm going to introduce a probability measure mu on x and a distance measure, a distance, L, which uh, maps the output space y cross y into the positive reals. And the perfect setting that uh, one would like to approach is as follows. We uh, look at the distance between the truth psi dagger, which we don't know, and this parametric class of functions evaluated at theta, compute the expectation of that over all possible inputs, and that gives you a function of theta. And then um, the ideal setting, one would minimize this over theta to find a theta star which makes the parametric function psi as close as possible to psi dagger by this measure. Right, that would be what one would like to do in a perfect setting. As emphasized, we don't however have access to psi dagger, we only have samples of input and output pairs. So in this setting that means that we have xn, which are distributed iid according to this measure mu, and yn, 
which are distributed IID according to the push forward of mu under the map Psi dagger. Um, Given that, that, please. Sorry, there, there are a couple of questions, perhaps I could just uh, ask them. Uh, yeah. So the first question says, uh, with reference to um, image or cat example, category examples, how do I think of the parameter space theta? So ev even if the um, output space Y is categorical, um, so that would be this case here, the parameter space theta is still usually uh, a subset of the Euclidean space. So these are um, RP. So the, um, I'm not sure if I answered the right question, but the, the, in the case of classification, the output space is made up of just classes. But in all cases that I'm going to cover today, the parametric space is Euclidean space. Okay, um, yeah, I think that explains it. And then there's a second, um, yeah, that seems fine. And then a second comment saying, uh, if neural networks uh, are used, then elements of theta are weights of neural nets. That's correct, yes. So the, the, that's, that's correct. The elements, the choice of theta is the choice of the parameters that parameterize the neural network. And I will write down a neural network as an example of psi and put it into this notation in a few slides time. Okay, and then one final question. Um, it says, uh, is IID on the XI's a working assumption or something you read from the data? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, it's a working assumption which may not necessarily apply. Um, there are many interesting applications, for example, where data comes in in a streaming fashion and may be thought of as being generated by a Markov process or partial observation of a Markov process. And um, so one can generalize beyond um, IID mu and look at settings where there is a, maybe a correlation structure in the data. And uh, last question, is the measure mu known or unknown? The measure mu is only known to us through the X ends in the setting that I'm describing at this point here. Um, I'll readdress that question when we come to look at problems where the X's are elements of a Banach space and the kind of applications I have in mind there, in which it may be reasonable to know more about mu. Okay, thank you for answering those. Thank you, all very helpful questions. And please do keep asking questions as we go along. I may not get as far as I like, but then at least um, I will have explained something. Okay, so just to, to recap, um, yeah, sorry. We, so we have this perfect objective function. Um, we do not have psi dagger, we just have samples xn and yn. And so instead, what one does in practice is write down an empirical approximation, replacing the expectation over mu, um, over x distributed according to mu, by an empirical approximation. And that gives rise to the objective function Jn. And then this is what is done in practice. This is minimized, although I'm brushing a lot of stuff under the carpet because the, this is typically a non-convex optimization problem. But um, in principle, one would like to compute the optimizer of this, and I'll call that theta star n. So this is called training, and I'm going to use that terminology as we go on. Um, testing refers to having computed a parameter estimate theta star, evaluating how good it is. Um, here one introduces an error measure, um, E sub capital N, capital N being the number of data points, and evaluate the distance between psi at the trained value of the parameter theta, that's theta star N, uh, from the true map psi dagger. Um, but again, we don't have psi dagger. So in testing, we again approximate the error measure by something empirical using uppercase M points. And that gives rise to an error measure ENM. And through, <coughs> this testing can be done with a different measure from the one used in the input space. But for this talk, uh, I will assume that mu prime and mu are identical, but that the points with primes on them are independent of the points used in the training part of the talk where there was no prime present. But looking at the setting where mu and mu prime are different is also relevant and interesting, uh, but not part of this talk. So, so there's one question, is there any further assumption on L? 
Um, not at this point. I will be explicit about L later on. I'm really just trying to introduce this quite abstractly. Um, that, the, but it's a very good question and links back to the difference between regression and classification. Um, in regression, often just an L2 measure is used, uh, whereas in classification, there are cross entropy measures used. Uh, to deal with the fact that the output space is um, classes rather than Euclidean space. So different choices of L are used and they will be adapted to the specific application. When I get to my applications, I will be concrete. Okay, so here is the canonical example, which is a, of the function psi, which is a neural network. So I'm, remember, I want to write down a mapping from x to um, psi of x parameterized by theta <clears throat> and a deep or wide neural network can be written in the following form. Um, you make a linear transformation of the input x, then you iterate the following mapping where sig there's an example of sigma in the panel below, but you think of sigma as being a um, monotonic increasing or non-decreasing function. Um, the specific example below is the ReLU function, but it's not does not have to be that sigma. Um, so VK plus one is sigma applied to a linear transformation of VK. And then after iterating this K times, one applies a further linear transformation to bring um, the output into the appropriate space where the outputs live. So think of this X here as being in um, Euclidean space and the output psi as being in a different, possibly different Euclidean space. There are a bunch of parameters here, the linear transformation or the affine transformation defined by A and A, the affine transformation defined by B and B, and the affine transformation at each step K defined by the W's and the omegas. So together the union of all of those parameters is theta and the objective of um, using this form to approximate data is to choose those parameters so that the transformation from x to psi of x matches what you see in the data. We have two um, more questions. Um, what is omega k and uh, why is monotonicity a requirement? Yes, yeah, so um, omega k, so the parameters, the a's, uh, the b's, and the w's and the omegas are parameters to be chosen to make the mapping psi match data? That's the answer to the first question. Um, I think really the answer to the monotonicity of sigma goes back to the historical development of this subject, um, which is long forgotten in some sense, but historically neural networks were developed by analogy with an attempt to understand how the brain worked and the firing of neurons. Um, those ideas are really less relevant now, but because of the development of the subject, on that basis, um, there's a lot of technology invested in sigmas which are monotonically increasing and a lot of theory which exploits that fact. Okay, so um, what I want to do is study the problem we've just been talking about, but in the setting where the input spaces X and Y are spaces of functions. And the reason that's interesting is there are lots of very expensive to compute computational tasks that are undertaken in science and engineering, which transform one function into another. The canonical example would be solving the Navier-Stokes equations, which can be viewed as a mapping that takes an initial condition, say an L2 function on the torus, and transforms it into another L2 function on the torus, which would represent the solution at time one. Um, Supervised learning holds the possibility of speeding up those computations by doing them maybe a million times, recording the inputs and the outputs, and then using supervised learning to replace an expensive computer code by a neural network or something of that type, which can be evaluated more quickly than the original computer code. So this is something that many people are trying to study on, on an applied level in many, many different ways. And because in many problems in science and engineering, the inputs and outputs are themselves functions, it's interesting to try and develop a conceptual way of thinking about supervised learning to determine approximate mappings between 
function spaces. Now, in practice, one has to discretize and replace function spaces by Euclidean spaces. And what I want to show you on this slide and explain how I overcome it in later slides is issues that arise from the fact that uh, Banach spaces, when discretized, give rise to large Euclidean spaces. So I'm going to show you um, what happens if we take an excellent paper by, by Zhu and Zabras, which trained a neural network which mapped between discretizations of Banach spaces. I'll explain the specific problem a bit later on. Um, their work was, I'll explain what these axes are as well. Their work was this triangle at the bottom left here. So there is a, a partial differential equation I will show you. It takes as input a function and produces as output a function. You discretize it with some level of resolution. That's the axis along here. And in the case of the Zhu and Zavaras work, this was a, a resolution of 50. That referred to a 50 by 50 grid. Um, and then one carries out the machinery that I have described, um, train a neural network to um, approximate the mapping which represents the solution operator of a partial differential equation and compute the error. And they get a relative test error of uh, 2%. So this is excellent. It means that at this level of grid resolution, um, it's possible to replace the expensive solution of partial differential equation by the evaluation of a neural network. However, if you take their methodology and apply it verbatim, at different levels of grid resolution. So these are uh, more refined approximations of the input and output Banach spaces that define the problem. If you take their methodology and apply it verbatim on increasing resolution, so moving to the right along the bottom axis, one is approaching the continuum limit of a Banach space. Then what you see is that the test error, which is a measure of how good the trained neural network is, grows and it grows um, here up to around 10% and starts to become unacceptable. So this is something we'd like to avoid. Um, we've all heard about flattening the curve in a different context, and you're all sick of hearing about flattening the curve, so I'm gonna tell you more about flattening the curve, but it's a different curve. I want to flatten this curve, and I'm going to explain to you a conceptual idea and three instantiations of it that will make sure that this curve remains flat, meaning that the error that one obtains in training a neural network is independent of the level of resolution used to represent the Banach spaces that underlie the problem to represent them on a grid, okay? So you will see later um, three different examples where when I plot this picture, the curve is flat. And I want to explain how to do that and this is the one overarching idea in this talk, and it's the key idea in the top slide here. And the idea is that one should design the architecture. That means the form of the function psi, parametrically dependent on theta. One should conceptualize this function on Banach space and then discretize it. So I'll return to this slide in a moment. What you see in this graph here is a result of doing things in the opposite order. The algorithm is developed by first discretizing and then coming up with an algorithm. And if you, if you do that, discretize and then come up with an algorithm, when you um, apply that idea at different levels of discretization, the error grows, right? So it's a very simple idea and it, it's prevalent in many areas of science and engineering. This idea that algorithms should be conceived on Banach space before discretization, before discretization, that's a powerful idea, widely used. And what I'm doing is trying to carry out that way of thinking in the context of um, supervised learning between Banach spaces. So just to remind you then, in this setting, we're trying to find a mapping psi dagger which maps one separable Banach space X into another Y. And the assumption is that we're given pairs Xn and Yn, where the Xn's are IID from mu, and the Yn's are IID from the push forward of mu under psi dagger. And 
this is really just the repetition of what I described in the general setting. The goal is we, we, we will introduce, well, this is what's called an architecture, a class of operators that map the Banach space X crossed with parameter space theta into Y, and then try and choose an element of theta so that evaluated at theta star, this mapping psi is close to psi dagger. Psi dagger is only available to us through data. Okay, that's, that's the goal. And, and the idea is in the top box. If you, if you design the architecture, that is you construct the function psi on Banach space and then discretize, then you come up with algorithms which behave well in the sense of flattening the curve. And that has implications. It means, for example, that you can learn a neural network on one level of grid resolution or with one specific way of representing the Banach space finite dimensionally. Having learnt it, um, if you subsequently resolve your grid resolution, you can reuse the same mapping which you have already learnt. And so the learning of the mapping is independent of the, the way that the Banach spaces are discretized and represented on a computer. And that's the fundamental idea. So I'm going to describe now three instantiations of that idea, but perhaps it will be a good place to pause and just ask if there are any questions about the setting uh, before talking about specifics. Okay, should I carry on? Thanks. All right, so let me describe um, the first instantiation of this idea. Um, and this is through model reduction. So the goal of this work is to approximate a mapping which takes Banach space X to Y on the basis of data. So that's the left or right hand downward arrow in this picture. Um, the idea of using model reduction is as follows. Um, I want to exploit the existence of neural networks in finite dimensions. And to do that, I'm going to reduce the dimension of the input Banach space to a finite dimensional space, D sub X. And I also want to reduce the dimension of the infinite dimensional output space to a finite dimensional space, DY. So I'm going to try and find uh, mappings F and G. F reduces dimension and G expands dimension so that the composition of G and F is approximately the identity. And I want to do this on the input space X and the output space Y. Okay, and we'll in fact do that by means of principal components analysis, which um, I will come back to on the next slide. But that is a, um, a way of finding approximate factorizations of the identity, which um, involved dimension reduction from an infinite dimensional space to a finite dimensional space. And then um, having reduced the dimension to try and find a mapping phi, uh, lowercase phi, var phi, um, with the property that if I, now remember what I want to do is go is to take this arrow down here. I'm going to make an approximation in which I reduce the dimension I will then use a neural network approximation in this finite dimensional space and then expand the dimension again. So for this to work, I have to have a good choice for, for var phi and I have to have a good choice for doing this dimension reduction so that, so that the composition of G with F on both the space X and Y is approximately the identity. Uh, sorry, Andrew, could I just interrupt again with another question? Um, yeah. So when you have an, an error, in the in the model, how does that how does that get incorporated? Um, so, is the question perhaps about the the fact that the error that psi dagger itself is imprecise? Um, I don't know if that's the question, but if that is the question, um, I'm assuming that psi dagger itself is um, exactly evaluated at this point. But some of the methods I describe in the next section will allow for errors in Psi Dagger. More generally, the framework that we use provides a, a stable framework which should be robust to approximation of Psi Dagger. But that will not be something I discover 
discuss in this talk. Thanks, Amanda. Okay, so I want to, to, to make this method work. I want to reduce the dimension, find G and F which compose to give the identity and identify a function var phi, uh, which gives rise to the approximation property on the bottom slide. And um, as I've said, the methodology for doing this is I'm going to use principal components analysis to find approximate factorizations of the identity. And um, so now you should think of, so principal components analysis, essentially, I'm not going to write this down, but this corresponds remembering that there is a measure mu on X and it's pushed forward under psi dagger uh, on Y. Um, one can compute from this a, um, an eigenvalue problem, which characterizes aspects of the properties of the measure mu and under um, moment conditions on the measure mu and its push forward under psi dagger, give rise to approximate factorizations of the identity of the form here with controllable errors. And those controllable errors depend on the precise properties of the measure mu, moment decay and so forth. So using principal components analysis, we identify approximate factorizations of the identity. And then if we define um, var phi in this way as fy psi dagger gx, if you define what I'll call psi pca in the following fashion here, notice that if I put var phi into this composition of maps, I will on the left have the composition of gy with fy, which is approximately the identity. And on the right, I will have the composition of gx with fx, which is approximately the identity. And those approximations of the identity can be controlled. And as a consequence, the resulting function psi pca can be controlled as an approximation of psi dagger. These pca, um, these are projections, they can be computed approximately from data and theorems can be found to quantify how accurately they can be approximated on the basis of data. That will come up in the theorem on the next slide. So then the idea is having identified these approximate factorizations of the identity and being able to approximate them with data, we then approximate var phi by a neural network, which I call psi. That is done through a training procedure similar to the ones I've described to you earlier. And then one defines an overall approximation, psi nn for neural network, which um, involves the use of principal components analysis to reduce the finite dimensions, the use of a neural network to compute a mapping in the finite dimensional space, and the, the use again of principal components analysis to lift the finite dimensional space back up to the infinite dimensional space. And um, the beautiful thing about this setting is that one can find theory to justify all of the steps described and that gives rise to the, the following theorem. So this is the theorem about the approximation of psi dagger, which is an operator mapping separable Banach space X into separable Banach space Y. We're approximating by the function psi n n that I described to you on the previous slide. We compute the average of the error in the output space, uh, the L2 error, if you like, with respect to the input space, um, L2 mu error. And then we note that the neural network is trained uh, using data xj, which is distributed according to mu, and I'm averaging over that. And the basic theorem says that um, for any epsilon, we can choose dimensions of the um, dimension reduction that results from PCA, and we can choose a requisite amount of data and find we can find a neural network, which will then depend on epsilon and these dimensions to achieve given, given error. So this, um, proving this builds on um, some very nice analysis of um, principal components analysis and the properties of the decay of the spectrum of the covariance operator defined by measure mu and it's pushed forward under psi dagger. And then um, work of Yurotsky concerning the approximation of neural networks. There's lots of related work in this general area of approximating maps between um, Banach spaces. Uh, papers 10 and 11 
are examples of that, which um, are different from the methodology that I describe here because they require knowledge of the of the map side dagger, whereas the method we describe here is purely data driven. Uh, and then there's re relevant work of Kutoniok and co and co-workers and Chris Schwab and co-workers uh, on the approximation of the neural network. And in, in fact, uh, combining this work of Schwab and Zek on some specific problems um, would be an interesting direction, which would lead to greater it, greater insight into the nature of the relationship between the cost of implementing this method and the size of the error. Okay, so let me just show you how this works and show to you that the curve can indeed be flattened. Um, the example I want to describe to you of a mapping between Banach spaces, uh, there are several, but I'll focus on one of them, comes from this linear partial differential equation in divergence form. Um, there are lots of mappings of interest here that one might consider, but I'm going to look at the mapping from the coefficient, which is a function in L infinity, <clears throat> into the solution space U, which is a H1 function. So hence red, this nonlinear map from A to U. Um, L infinity, of course, is not separable Banach space, but I will work with probability measures that are um, supported on separable Banach spaces in L infinity. And there are other mappings that might be of interest, the mapping from the boundary data to G to the solution or the mapping from the forcing F to the solution. I might return to them later. And as I promised, um, I'm going to be explicit about the distance. So the distance measure here is the relative, <coughs> excuse me, the relative L2 error uh, on the domain D where this partial differential equation is posed. Okay, so I'm now going to show you that uh, we can flatten the curve on a specific example. So the, the measure mu, uh, so on the left here is a typical input and on the right is a typical output. So this is the coefficient of the partial differential equation. <clears throat> the measure mu is a random function which takes two values known to us uh, with random interfaces. The random interfaces are the level sets of a Gaussian random field, the zero level set. And uh, th this is a typical draw from that function. Uh, and this is the output that you get when you solve the elliptic equation, which has that rough coefficient as the, uh, as the coefficient. And this figure is, it demonstrates the flattening of the curve that I referred to earlier. Because of the, the way that the method is designed, namely that it is designed to make sense conceptually on a Banach space. It has the property that no matter what resolution you use, you get essentially the same error. So along the, the axis at the bottom is the level of resolution. That means in this case, a two dimensional problem. So when you see a hundred, that means we approximate the function on a unit square by a, a grid of size hundred by hundred, 200 by 200, 300 by 300, et cetera. Um, on the left axis is the test error defined earlier in the slides, which measures how effective the neural network is that we have trained. And then there are three curves here, which refer to the dimension of the principal components analysis, which is used on the basis of the eigenfunctions of the covariance operator of the measure mu to reduce the dimension of the um, space from infinite dimension to finite dimension. So there are three curves. Let's just look at the one. All of, the point is that all of them are roughly flat. Um, so let's just look at the red one. Um, the point here is that this, this curve is flat and that one achieves 3% error at all levels of resolution. And that's because the algorithm is designed so that even in infinite resolution, one would achieve that error. Um, that's the first thing. And that's the most important takeaway of the methods that I'm introducing in this talk. Second thing of interest is that um, as I increase D, which is the dimension reduction computed by means of principal components analysis, um, the error also reduces. So that is reflecting the fact that um, the intrinsic properties of the measure mu on space X um, 
lead to certain decay properties of the spectrum of the covariance operator associated to that mu and the rate of decay of that um, of the spectrum determines the rate at which these curves come down as we go from d is 20 to 50 to 70. Okay, so th that is an example of one of three methods I hope to cover in, at some level in this talk, which uh, flattens the curve and essentially constructs a, a neural network architecture, which is well-defined on Banach space. Um, the second method I want to describe is not a neural network, but based on something called the random features method. And um, this makes nice connections with uh, reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces. And I will try and explain some of those to you based on the assumption that you've not seen reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces before, but if you have, there may in any case be something interesting about the way that they are used in this context. So just to, to reorient you in terms of the talk, there's this one overarching idea, which I keep repeating, which is that uh, one should design approximation architectures on Banach space and then discretize. That's a good idea. I hope I've convinced you of that with the one example I've shown you. I'm now going to show you a second example of the same approach. Um, but it's of independent interest. There's some nice probabilistic structure in this, um, in this methodology of random features. So I'm going to describe to you a different architecture or design of approximation space psi m. And the, the methodology goes like this. Um, we take, we construct a set of random functions psi which map from the input Banach space X to output Banach space Y. Um, and they're random, they're parameterized by gamma, which is distributed according to measure nu, uh, probability measure nu. Nu comes from this probability space at the top here. And the idea of the random feature model is, is very intuitive. One randomizes by choosing gamma at random from nu, m times iid, one constructs m random functions that map x to y. So here they are. So psi is the random function from x to y evaluated at x uh, for the specific random choice gamma j. And the architecture is to look for a linear combination of these random functions and choose the theta j's, which are the weights that make this linear combination choose them so that psi m approximates psi dagger, again, in a data-driven fashion. So um, this idea goes back to a paper um, around 2007 of Rahimi and Recht, who looked at this idea and developed a theory for it in the case where X and Y are finite dimensional spaces. Um, I'm going to lift it up here to an infinite dimensional setting but many of the ideas are interesting even in finite dimensions and I hope to get those across to you. So in words, what we're trying to do is um, approximate a given mapping from X to Y by a linear combination of random mappings from X to Y. And you know, if you think about low dimensional problems, we have a, a great deal of insight about how to approximate maps from one space to another. Uh, we, for example, love Fourier analysis and we understand more generally that orthonormal bases are good ways of representing um, maps between Hilbert spaces, for example. Um, sorry, maps between uh, finite dimensional Euclidean spaces. But when X and Y are infinite dimensional, it's often very difficult to construct good orthonormal bases that are both computable, good for computation, and uh, intuitive. The simple idea of the random features method is that one tries to probe mappings from X to Y by constructing a rich set of random functions and using them to represent the mapping from X to Y. Okay, that's the concept. So let me just show you an example of this in finite dimensions. So here, I'm going to take input space R2 and output space R. So I'm looking at functions from R2 to R. Now, if you had to approximate such functions, you 
might well use Fourier series in finite dimensions. But I just want to show you what the random features idea looks like in this setting where you can visualize it. I'm going to write down a continuum analog of the um, deep neural network that I wrote down earlier on. Um, the details are something you don't need to pick up on, but um, this is a, a flow. Um, and this idea of looking at neural networks through flows goes back to uh, Eldad Haber and Wayne and Er in two separate papers and their co-workers. Um, I think what I'd like to get across to you is that th this is a random flow parameterized by here random functions of time. Um, what I show to you here at the bottom are two instances of the random functions constructed by this random flow. The idea of the random features method would be to approximate a function from R2 to R by linear combinations of such random functions. Again, I emphasize that as a mapping from R2 to R, you would never do this. You would use Fourier analysis, something of that type. That would be a, a sensible approach. But again, thinking of lifting X and Y to being infinite dimensional spaces, the concept between behind random features is that by using random functions, um, one can effectively explore possible transformations of the input space to the output space. All right, so let me describe to you a little bit of the theory that uh, goes behind this. So the key concept is that from the random function, psi, one can make a kernel. And the kernel is a mapping from the input space crossed with itself to the space of linear operators um, from the output space into itself. And that kernel is constructed by taking the expectation of the outer product of the features. So here, Y is a Hilbert space. And it's the expectation with respect to these random features. That gives what's known as a reproducing kernel Hilbert space. And um, perhaps the simplest way to connect this with ideas in probability that some of the audience may be more familiar with would be to think of um, a very simple example of the case where for example psi is a brownian bridge um, so that would be a function from the unit interval say into r and it's a random function um, and then in this case uh, y would just be r x would be the unit interval zero one if psi were brownian bridge then this reproducing kernel Hilbert space will be the space uh, H10. And so indeed the reproducing kernel Hilbert space would be the Cameron Martin space associated with the Gaussian random function that is a Brownian bridge. Okay, so there's a um, connection between reproducing kernel Hilbert space and Cameron Martin space. So in particular, the random function psi is not in the reproducing kernel Hilbert space just as a random, for example, Brownian bridge, but more generally um, in any infinite dimensional space, a draw from the measure is not in the Cameron Martin space. Nonetheless, waving hands in a way uh, for the moment, um, it's possible to get an integral representation of any function f in the reproducing kernel Hilbert space. Um, so f is mapping uh, x to y um, as an integral transform, if you like, or in it, I won't call it a transform because it's not invertible, but an integral representation of any function f. And that representation is here. So one takes the, um, the, the random function, the random feature psi, and then there's a coefficient theta which depends on the random parameter gamma, which is just formally the inner product of the function f with the random feature psi in the reproducing kernel Hilbert space. So th this in fact needs to be interpreted as a stochastic integral. Uh, it's only defined in an L2 sense. But this gives intuition because it, it tells us that any function from x to y can be represented as a, a linear transformation of these random features. And that opens up the possibility, maybe the most naive thing to do, would be to look at um, a Monte Carlo approximation of this representation and use that as a way of approximating f as a linear combination of random features psi. So that turns out not to be a good way to 
computationally to proceed because the coefficients involve an inner product in this reproducing Colonel Hilbert space, which is not explicitly known. It's defined, the, the standpoint here is that you know the random features, and although they define this kernel and the reproducing Colonel Hilbert space, you don't really know this. And so the method that is used is Monte Carlo-like, but it avoids uh, knowledge of the reproducing Colonel Hilbert space and involves only knowledge of the random features psi. And indeed it connects to an infinite dimensional analog of Gaussian process regression. And uh, this comes back to a question someone asked earlier about incorporating um, error in the, the mapping F that one is trying to minimize. So a, a classical approach, Gaussian process regression to finding function F that maps data that, that is consistent with data pairs Xn and Yn is to minimize um, this L2 misfit between the function f applied to the input data xn and the output yn and regularized by um, a reproducing Colonel Hilbert space norm. Um, and even in this infinite dimensional setting, there's something called the representative theorem that tells you that the minimizer of this can be written as a linear combination of the kernels. However, as I've emphasized, we don't have the kernels we only have the random functions which implicitly define the kernel. However, um, if one approximates this reproducing kernel Hilbert space by an empirical approximation of the kernel K based on the random features, uh, then this Gaussian process regression reduces to a very straightforward quadratic optimization problem to identify parameters theta such that the linear combination of the random functions linearly combined by theta matches the data and there's um, a regularization penalty which penalizes large theta. So the, using this approach one can compute entirely based on use of random features, computations for theta L uh, in finite dimensional Euclidean space, whereas the representer theorem up here requires knowledge of the kernel, which we don't know, uh, and the beta L's here are themselves functions and not uh, scalars. So this leads to a, an actual computational methodology. And what I want to do is show you that again, uh, this will, I will finish the talk with this, um, one can flatten the curve by using this methodology. So the mapping I'm going to take here is the mapping that takes the initial condition of Berger's equation to the solution at time one. So Berger's equation is a, is a involves a, it's a heat equation with a nonlinear advection term. And so I'm going to look, look at a mapping psi dagger which takes u zero in L2 on the torus into the solution, solution at time one, um, which is in any, Sobolev space HR for any R. And so a typical example of uh, mapping from input to output here is a given here. here. On the left is the initial condition and on the right is the solution at time one. Again, I, I can't overemphasize, I'm not approximating just that. Uh, this, in this methodology, we're approximating the entire mapping from all initial conditions in L2 to the solution at time one. And we again flatten the curve in that the methodology that I've described using random features leads to um, an error of about ranging here between uh, 0.3 and 0.4 percent, which is independent of the level of resolution used to approximate the finite the infinite dimensional spaces between which we map. Um, the N here refers to the amount of data available in the training <clears throat> and you see another feature which is that as we increase the amount of data the error decreases. So I, I, I want to wrap up but I just want to say there's a third methodology um, uh, which we refer to as the graph, graph kernel approach. I'm sorry that um, I have not had time to describe this but you have the archive reference there if you're interested in reading about this method and I would like to just of course, I flattened the curve with this method as well. Um, and there's an example showing that we can reproduce the Green's function, which is a canonical operator for a partial differential equation mapping input to output. 
Um, so let me just conclude. Um, what I wanted to explain was that neural networks have been incredibly successful uh, in data-driven function approximation, empirically very successful, and uh, typical examples are regression and classification um, between RM and RN, and RM and classes one up to K. What I've been looking at is mappings between function spaces, and the motivation is speeding up a large number of tasks in uh, science and engineering, which map functions, one function to another. Um, I've shown you that in general, it's bad to discretize and apply the ideas that are in bullet two. And what the good idea is to conceive of the architecture in the function space and then discretize. The method is purely data driven. You don't have to know anything about Psi Dagger, although I've shown applications to PDEs where Psi Dagger is defined implicitly by the solution operator of the PDE. But there can be many other applications in which we don't necessarily have a model and we can learn it by this methodology. Um, the slides are available on, on the uh, One World website and all of, all of the references you'll be able to follow up from there. So I'd like to thank you for your attention and again, thank the organizers for making this possible. It's a great idea. So thank you very much for that uh, very nice talk. Um, so there's been quite a few questions in the in the chat. Um, I'll do my best to read them out. If I miss your question, please just just ask it again because the uh, the chat's been going quite quite fast. Uh, fortunately, your students and collaborators have done a very good job of uh, of answering the the questions. Um, so the first question: um, Would it be possible to derive some additional asymptotics here related also to the error bounds, possibly by Stein or Malib and Stein approaches? And how would this depend on the type of approach used, regression or classification? Um, I think the general answer to the question is there's a lot of room for analysis of the approximation error in neural nets in general, even in finite dimensions and including classification. Um, it's an empirically successful field, which is crying out for um, mathematicians to get involved. That's the first thing, even in the finite dimensional classical settings. Um, within the context of the infinite dimensional settings that I've described, um, the model reduction work comes with a theorem, um, but that theorem itself is pretty basic. And as I indicated, there's a lot of room for improve, improvement of that theory and the, the relationship between the number of parameters needed and the error is something that needs to be studied more deeply. And there's work of Schwab and Zeck, which is relevant to that question for some specific PDE problems. But generally, that is a very open area. Um, regarding the random features method, um, there is analysis in finite dimensions. Um, I have, there, there is no convergence proof that I'm aware of in this infinite dimensional setting. Um, we have a theory which makes the relationship to um, Gaussian, to, um, well, Gaussian process regression. And that opens up the possibility of proving theorems there, um, but that, that's still open. So I think, yes, the answer to your question is yes, all of those things are open and interesting. And I would, you know, I'm an applied mathematician. I'm very, this is a very applied field, but it's one which is crying out for um, good probabilists and analysts to get involved and make a substantial underpinning to what is a great empirical success. Okay, thank you. Um, we've got a second question here saying, uh, can you comment on how expensive the implementation of the random output maps are, uh, or comment on the computational complexity? Yes, so um, there are a number of different things to say about that. Um, we are working very hard to try and make the complexity as low as possible. Um, let me take the random features example. Um, we have worked there I didn't even tell you what the random features were, but they're computed in Fourier space. And the reason for doing that is precisely to try and make the evaluation as fast as possible. Um, I can, if you look at the paper archive link on the, on the slides, you'll see in detail how we do that. Um, so that, that, that is essentially the evaluation of that method is on the order of the number of grid points multiplied by the number of random features. Um, the model reduction um, 
complexity will depend on the properties of the measure mu on x and the rate of um, the, with the, the rate of, at which the spectrum of the um, covariance operator that one uses in the in the principal components analysis goes to zero. Um, our theorem, as I indicated earlier, is not sharp, and at least for some specific problems, such as the elliptic equation I showed you, there's room for improvement there using the analyticity of the mapping from the input coefficient to the solution of the PDE. Um, I think that's all, I, all I'll say on that question for now. Um, question from Jean-Christophe. Uh, can you train your algorithm to learn to solve Navier-Stokes on small domains and then use it to solve Navier-Stokes on larger domains that would be unreachable by standard PDE methods? There, there are, there is, I wouldn't want to claim that yet, but, but that sort of question is, is part of our thinking. That's a quite a big challenge, what's being proposed there, but I think certainly there are possibilities of doing such things. I didn't describe the graph neural network approach, but that approach has intrinsic within it the possibility of training on parts of the domain and learning about other parts of the domain. Whether or not that's effective depends on how clever one is in constructing the architecture, and we have no theory. Um, but we do have uh, empirical evidence on simpler problems than Navier-Stokes that things of the type you describe might be possible. Oh, Amanda, you're muted. Uh, sorry, so Rob has a has a question now. Um, I'll just unmute him. Um, and for other people who are waiting, the plenty of questions. I know you're coming. Um, just please be patient, and I'll I'll come to you. But uh, no, yeah, if Rob could ask his question, please. Hi, Andrew. Uh, thanks. Excellent talk. Um, I I uh, I'm only gonna uh, ask about the first one, the PCA one. When you yeah. saw the when we saw the numerics. You one saw that when you went with the D down from 20 to 50 to 70 or up, the error started to grind a bit to a halt. So isn't there an interplay of two things? The, the aspect of uh, the, the refinement of the grid and the non-convex optimization problem for the neural network. So I'm just wondering whether in these lower dimensional cases, you're still benefiting from the low dimension and then actually the, the neural network, the problem of training a neural network is really... So okay. what I'm trying to say is that the, the problem with the zoo, the, the original approach of the paper, would, would your curve start to grow as well when, when you go to higher dimensions? Um, it, it's, a, it's a very good question you ask and it's something regarding the training of the neural network, it's something I brushed under the carpet. Um, the, in, in the case of the this method that we're now looking at, the model reduction method, it's a non-convex optimization problem, and you're right that we have no guarantees that we found the optimal solution. Um, we're just re using standard mm -hmm. um, stochastic gradient descent. So it would be interesting to see what happens when the D gets higher and when actually your problem is high dimension enough that the, this problem will occur. So I think, but I want to say one other thing, there's another source of the reason that the error saturates here is, of course, because we also have finite data. Mm -hmm. So if, if you look to the theorem, um, this is the way I like to think about this approximation theorem. It's an infinite dimensional setting. But um, the, firstly, what one needs to choose the dimensions of the reduced space to get so that the principal components analysis um, produces an error less than epsilon. So that's an intrinsic property of the measure mu. It's got nothing to do, well, it ha it, on the space x, it's got to do with the measure mu. On the space y, it's got to do with the push forward of mu under psi dagger. Um, then one chooses an amount of data, and this is the thing I wanted to emphasize. I see. Um, the data then has to be large enough that you accurately approximate the PCA. So I think that this figure here would probably I like to think that we're not yet being hit by any problems with the neural network training, but rather by the finite amount of data. Mm -hmm. And indeed, in the, the later figure I showed with the random features method, um, 
I'm here now uh, looking at the effect of the data and you see that effect that I'm describing there. Yeah. So with finite amount of data, there will always be a residual error. One of the nice things about the random features method is that it's a convex optimization. It's just quadratic minimization problem. Thanks. Thank you, Rob. Sorry, um, I wasn't. I was muted there. Um, so Volfang has his hand raised. I'll just unmute um, him to ask that question. Uh, sorry, it's not unmuting. Um, it doesn't do it. I, I think that's worse now. Yeah. Do you hear me? Yes. Could you start again? Uh, uh, okay. Thanks, Andrew. Great talk. Thank you. I, I have a principal question, also on the first part, but it pertains to some extent to the later part as well. So your, your model reduction part based on PCA is inherently linear. On, on the other hand, uh, you would expect in particular in high dimensions that you could benefit very much from the very nonlinear parameterization through a deep network. So uh, maybe I'm missing something, but isn't the linear part a restriction to what you can do? And the success in this particular example of the elliptic problem, isn't it related to the fact that the parameter to solution map is holomorphic? That means in principle, linear approximations do already very well because the end widths decay quickly. So the I mean, there the are a number of overlapping effects. <laughs> and I don't know what, see, yeah. see what I, mean? I, I totally agree with you. So let me just say that for, we started uh, exploring this problem without using PCA. We rather used uh, what's known as a, a variational autoencoder. So that it is a data-driven way of finding the dimension reduction, which has proven very successful in a number of areas of um, machine learning. In this particular case, and I think what you have just said has bearing on that, we could never beat PCA. So we tried more complicated nonlinear dimension reduction. And in particular, uh, Nick Kovachki, who's uh, one yeah, of the true, authors on this paper, tried yeah. a lot of things. We, we never beat PCA. Yeah, and, so, the end, end with CK quickly. If you limit the number of, uh, um, of parametric variables, then you have an exponential decay of the end width. In other words, they are very close linear spaces. And PCA may be prone to getting them. But it would also mean that uh, with, a, with a greedy construction of a reduced basis, you might even do better. But in a way, this is still sweeping uh, an intrinsic obstruction under the rug, namely in order to do that latter greedy construction, you would have to control an L infinity error in high dimensions. And this is, if you, if you take it seriously and want to come up with a rigorous result, this is, I mean, this is prohibitive. So I wonder where in all this, this curse of dimensionality is hitting someplace or swept under the rug. And in, in this context, I'm gonna ask on this application to the conservation law, does it cover the regime where you develop a real shock? Um, let me just, before we go to conservation law, let me say that the curse of dimensionality is in here um, because there's, there's a neural network as well as using principal components analysis the approximation, so here it is, uh, G and F come from PCA. Psi is an, a neural network approximation. And the, the basic theorem that we use um, of Urotsky, it would involve complicated dependence of the dimension of the, or the depth of the neural network on these dimensions, dx and dy, and the parameter n, which relate to the approximation capabilities of PCA. So hidden in here, this statement about there is a neural network is the properties of the number of parameters required and the depth to represent this neural network. We have not used, uh, for example, what uh, Chris Schwab and, and Zek use in, in this paper, we've not used the um, properties of the Holomorphy of the mapping, for example, from a series yeah, representation but, of A to let me, well, let me caution you, Andrew. Even in that paper, what they show is they match what other, much simpler, established methods can do, namely a sparse polynomial uh, expansion. 
Yes, sorry, and, they, sorry. And, and, and they don't do as well as uh, Kolmogorov good spaces. So, yes, so in other let, words, let me... in, in, in these approaches, the neural net is always lagging behind. Letting, yes, so... alone the error of, uh, letting alone the question of the training. Yes, let, let me address that question. I agree with you. Um, we compared uh, our method with the reduced basis method, for example, and with um, Albert's methodology on a, a simpler, mm -hmm. not this problem, but on a simpler, simpler problem of, of Taylor polynomial approximation. And our method we find to be competitive, but not quite as good as either of those methods. Um, but I would like to stress that our method is data driven and requires, yeah. does not require the knowledge of the mapping. And so it holds the possibility of being used for problems where one just has data streams, which can be viewed as um, coming from function space. Yeah. And so th it's in that context that I would argue that these methodologies may be useful. Yeah. Um, and, and the fact that they are competitive with methods that you yourself have developed and Albert and um, Chris and Ron and others is um, encouraging. Oh yeah, I, I definitely agree. I just want to understand better. And that was my question to that uh, nonlinear problem. Yeah, so um, because, we, because I know there, I know the Kolmogorov widths decay much, much slower. So in other words, a linear approach may fail you. But um, in particular, when you cover the regime where you develop discontinuities along the way in the evolution. But yeah, so we, are, we are doing, I'm um, sorry, we do have viscosity. Um, and oh, I see. Okay, okay. So it's a still a parabolic problem. Yes, it's still parabolic, and you, okay, you know, so you have enough smoothing to to get out of that. You're an you're the analytic. Yeah, I, and, I, I, okay, I, I didn't notice that. And we um. The the, the spe uh, this is of course a different method. It's the random features method. But the, yeah, the I choice, that. I believe, the choice of the random features that we're using is mm -hmm. currently tuned to the specific value of the viscosity, and uh, we, the random features method works in Fourier space and is based on an intuitive understanding of how this equation works, namely that at low wave numbers it rearranges the energy and at high wave numbers you have decay. We build that into the random features and that would have to be done in a way that was delta dependent if you wanted some uniformity with respect to that parameter. We have not done that. Okay, I see. Thank you. Sorry, I, I, just like, um, I don't like to interrupt you, but there's a lot of people who want to ask questions. So perhaps we can carry on some of these discussions, um, the longer discussions afterwards in the, in the breakout room. But uh, next, I think Andreas had a, had a question. Oh, hi, thanks. Thank you for the talk, Andrew. Very nice. Quick question um, pertains to your complexity theorem, which is an existence theorem. So you, your main theorem on part one of the talk. Yes. Uh, you choose it, Simon, you choose the error, and you can construct uh, the dimension re reduction. And um, now, speaking as an amateur here, uh, the first, it's, a, it's an existence statement, so it's not clear what the construction of the um, neural network should be that allows you to say that you know there exists at least one. But I, is the clue here that you've written zero extended neural network, which I don't know what that means. Sorry, I should no. That that's you, you're you're correct. You're absolutely correct. Um, and this is not what you say does not just apply to this theorem, but to many theorems in this area. Um, for example, the papers eight and nine. Um, th they concern the existence of uh, neural networks within the overall class being considered. They do not address the question of whether those are computed by a given optimization scheme. They completely sidestep that question. Right. Um, that th the way the optimization is done is a very messy field, and I don't. So I'm I'm, I'm really not addressing it un, at all. I mean, that, but that's not uncharacteristic for this type of theorem. These, these are complexity theorems. Yeah, they're. Um, they, what what I would say is that um, in practice we find we can get the good yeah. errors that I describe in the picture without necessarily having the depth that might seem to be implied by application of the Yurotsky uh, neural network theorem that is underlies our theorem. 
so so the proof the proof of this existence and doesn't give you any doesn't really give you any hint as to you know where your first attempt at constructing a neural net my personal opinion on that is that it would be a it, they're possibly not the right way to go. I, the, the, although the optimization is a mess, it works very well for lots and lots of problems. And I think it would be unwise not to go with, without greater depth of understanding, it would be unwise not to just use the optimization methodology that's quite empirically well developed. Okay. The nice thing about the random features method is that those issues are sidestepped because it is a quadratic optimization problem. And for problems where in the future you can imagine wanting real guarantees on neural network tra or on the um, machine learn trained approximations, the advantages of having a quadratic optimization problem could be very could outweigh the advantages of, of using more complicated neural networks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you want guaranteed proofs for some safety critical reason. Thank you. Thanks for the answer. I'm okay. conscious of moving on to let someone else ask. Well, next we had, um, Albert had a, had a question, so I'll just uh, unmute you, Albert. Yeah. Um, hello. Th thank you, Andrew, for this nice talk. So my question has a, a little bit to do with Wolfgang's question. Um, you know, to, uh, to see how your, your framework really fits in the usual uh, a regression framework in learning theory. So the you know the difference that I see first is that this side dagger is not an unknown function because it's in in the example you gave at least it was given to you by PDEs that have all kind of properties. For example, you can say a lot of things on the smoothness of this function side dagger. And I think this should influence this knowledge should influence uh, your learning method, whether you choose a, a, a neural network or, a, or something else or a more classical method should depend on all this, uh, on this knowledge. And the second, the second thing is that uh, this XI, I mean, the, in the usual uh, uh, framework that you first describe on, on uh, regression in learning theory, these XIs are uh, come to you as uh, uh, randomly distributed. Uh, web, whereas here in your application, you could actually choose them because they are, uh, they are the input that you choose uh, uh, to, to solve your PDEs, if I understand well. So you have the choice in a way. It's more something that I could, we could qualify as a active learning. Uh, you see what I mean? I, uh, yes, I, I, I agree with you. So, uh, And I, I think that makes a big, big, big difference on the type of result that you can expect uh, on the objectives that you sh should have. <laughs> because so, if you can choose, uh, if you have the choice on where you, where you query, you query your function, your unknown function, and you have the choice where to query. That's a, a big responsibility in a sense. Yes, I, I agree with you. So firstly, I'm, I'm interested in the methodology because it can be applied in situations where we don't have the knowledge that you're describing. I think that is yeah, a potential. Yeah, I agree. That's the point. Yeah. But That's uh, when, true. when yeah. we do have that knowledge, um, it's, uh, I, th I think the, the things you've been describing to try and choose the, the measure mu uh, on the basis of design principles that are hold really interesting possibilities. Um, with one of, the, um, one of the collaborators on this work, um, uh, Birgit Liu, um, he comes from a material science background and has been using some of these ideas on more complicated problems arising in plasticity. Mm -hmm. And there we've been playing, and these are time dependent problems. We've been playing a lot with the, and this is just empirical, been playing a lot with the measure mu and trying to find measures mu with the property that if you train with data generated according to mu, you can use it on um, input samples that come from other measures in a successful way. We have only empirical experience of that, 
But that empirical experience is really interesting and it indicates that careful choice of the training measure can make a substantial difference to how effective the trained map is when you want to employ it uh, in the generalization sense outside of the training. I so I, I, I totally agree. Thank you. Thank you. And by the way, Albert, I agree with you that the social world where we meet in person is much better than this, but it's nice to see you this way anyway. Uh, just a few more questions. Um, so we have one um, asking, is it possible to find an architecture for any given data set? Yeah, so that question is a really good one, which comes to um, maybe the way I would frame that is if I look at this approximation class, um, if you look across all possible choices of theta, what is the, the envelope of all of the possible functions that are represented this way? Um, in the case of the random features method, I gave a complete answer to what that is because it's the reproducing Colonel Hilbert space. Um, in the case of the um, third method, which I didn't have time to describe, we actually don't really know what that space is. Um, there is, even in finite dimensions, there's limited work being done in this direction. And to, to study such questions for the first and the third methods um, would be very interesting and is open. But for the random features method, it's completely understood through the RKHS. Thanks. Uh, the last question that I have is um, Eunice uh, has their hand up, so let me just uh, unmute Eunice. Okay, so thank you, Andrew, for an interesting and very well paced uh, talk. Thank and you. Uh, my question is related to the dependence of the theorem and uh, the results on both the structure of the data and uh, the algorithm that you choose. So, on the one hand, uh, for example, if you have a PDE and there is a the, this, the, the PDE solution map, if it depends, if, if it requires some dependence on time and space, then it's, it's already involved there. So my first question is, uh, if we scrap the PDE, and I have a feeling uh, that uh, uh, the, the, there is a strong dependence on the structure, for example, on, 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 on time. Let's say I have functions of time, then I have streams of data, as you said, and um, uh, I want to, to and, and I, I have absolutely no idea on how the, 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 the outputs are classified. So would you just go about the, using that, uh, putting it in your black box and then just see what happens? And um, my second part of the, the question is also still related to uh, uh, the structure of the data. Let's say if I have functions of times, of time, then uh, it is in, in practice uh, what people use are actually different ar architectures. So let's say they use uh, recurrent neural networks or uh, uh, linear reservoirs, and uh, they they or and actually, so the theorem that you stated seemed to me to be related to maybe to to people neural networks. So what happens if I want to focus on the time dependence and use a recurrent neural networks to, to, to solve my problem? Yeah, I think, let me take the second question um, first. I, I think that um, I, I've not been looking at modeling dynamical systems. So the, the context in which recurrent neural networks are perhaps most important is learning about model error, for example, within dynamical systems where you have a partial model and you might try and explain the missing part of the model through a, a, an RNN structure. Within the context of this talk, the, although I have not looked at this for RNNs, um, wh were I to try and learn, for example, a, if I had a stream of data in a time dependent problem, um, which normally came from a partial differential equation, so at each time the um, output was a function, I would try and design an RNN that um, conceptually made sense on the Banach space, w w you know, for Banach space valued dynamical system. And I would do that for the reasons that I've hoped to have illustrated in this talk, namely that if you conceptualize the architecture before discretizing, 
you get more robust algorithms when you finally come to discretize. Uh, so, so I think that direction that you point out, um, namely the, the modeling of um, infinite dimensional dynamical systems where you have a data stream, um, that would be very interesting to look at it from the perspective of this talk. We haven't done that. But is it but is it very crucial to to assume that there is some 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 dynamic some uh, type of uh, differential equation behind it all? So let's say I just want to uh, have videos or or uh, um, streams of financial data, and I um, have absolutely no idea how uh, these things are classified. So uh, and and can I just you know uh, are there are there ways of just throwing it at this black box and see what happens? Or do you yeah, I would say something? No, I, I'm not a big believer in total black box. As you said in your, in your first question, I think building, and as Albert and Wolfgang were both uh, arguing, to the extent you have knowledge about your problem, you should build that into the architecture. That's, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's mad not to do that. Now, in the problems I've described, we know the PDE and we have implicitly used some of the information about the PDE in constructing the architecture. You can imagine other problems where we don't have a good model, um, but we nonetheless have data which could be viewed as functions. Um, not, still, in those cases, I believe there will be some domain-specific understanding and that that should be built into the architecture. And that, that's just a, a, yeah. um, that's a, a, a dogmatic belief. Uh, no, fair, fair enough. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you um, to, well, for such an interesting talk, and you can see how many questions we, we had. Uh, so what I'd like to do now is I'll just uh, unmute everyone, and we can um, all give a big round of applause to, uh, to Andrew. Thank you.